Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from Manila and good afternoon from Ulan Batar. I am Maricris Cabreros and I am the coordinator of the Network for Social Democracy in Asia. We are delighted and happy to welcome all of you to the online conference of SOCDEM Asia and the Progressive Alliance today hosted by its member party, the Mongolian People's Party. Welcome to our online conference, Roadmap to a Just and Democratic Normal. I will be joined by um, our speakers from Asia, from Europe, and we are joined by 25 political parties and organizations at the moment. So let me welcome um, our um, friends, our comrades from Asia. We have India, India National Congress, we have from Indonesia, Partai Solidaritas Indonesia. We have Partai Nasdem and PDI Perjuangan. From <coughs> Malaysia, um, we welcome the Democratic Action Party. From Myanmar, the Shan Nationalities League for Democracy and uh, the Democratic Party for New Society. We'd like to also welcome the Progressive Caucus Japan um, Nepali Congress, Akbayan Citizens Action Party from the Philippines, Fretilin of Timor Leste, Progressive Movement Thailand. A special welcome also to our friends from Europe, from the Progressive Alliance, from the Party of European Socialists, and the Party of European Socialists Women. Um, also from the United States, we have the Democratic Socialists of America, and also joining us from Tunisia is the Arab Social Democratic Forum. Welcome everyone. This is an important one, last but not the least for the year, to talk about actions and strategies. We know that this pandemic has re revealed already that we have a crisis on health, on the economy, and the crisis of democracy. And progressives worldwide have asserted all along that the system is flawed and the system has to change. So we will have a conversation this afternoon as we move forward and not return to the status quo, wherein the most marginalized, the poorest, the powerless are disproportionately affected by the crisis. This is a conversation with like-minded friends all over the world, and we invite you to join us this afternoon. May this be a start of our strategies and actions for 2021 as we move forward together for systemic change. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first of all, I would like to congratulate all of you that participating Roadmap to a Just and Democratic Normal Conference within 100 year anniversary of the Mongolian People's Party and 65th anniversary of the Strategy Academy. I'm very glad that this meeting is being held at the same time as this historical anniversary. The Mongolian People's Party is a political party with a social democratic ideology. Amendments of the concept brings well-known advantage through just and direct impact on people's lives. As a result, the Mongolian People's Party is working in a ruling party after the victory in the last two parliamentary and local elections. We collaborate with the like-minded parties in all fields as part of the promotion and pro um, propagation of the social democratic ideology. We have been members of the Progressive Alliance and Sokdem Asia for many years and working on the development of various sectors. I hope you, you will agree that we are meeting on an important issue at the right time. The conference is attended by Mongolian People's Party leaders, researchers and scholars from the Strategy Academy. Also the present of our partner and good friend, Mr. Nis Hegevich, resident representative of the um, face in Mongolia. 
The topic of today's conference is Roadmap to yes. Adjust and Democratic Normal. Many political and social changes are taking place globally and like-minded political parties face inevitable circumstances to work together on the continuation of the new norms of life after the pandemic and promote justice and democracy. I'm confident that the meeting conference will conclude with important decision from our delegates, scholars and party leaders on our coming the pandemic with minimal loss and strengthening a just democracy. Uh, thank you. Good luck with the conference. Uh, in order to, to celebrate the 65th anniversary of the Strategic Academy, we commissioned a study to, to investigate the um, institutionalization of Mongolian democracy. So how stable are parties? How developed are parties? Uh, how developed is democracy? And the preliminary findings show that in terms of the party system, in terms of the political institutions, uh, Mongolia is quite stable. Uh, democracy had a quite remarkable development. And of course, Mongolian People's Party as the oldest party, as the party that governed for the longest time as the party with the most members. It's not surprisingly the most stable party, but it's also a party with a lot of um, inner party, internal party democracy. Uh, so we have frequent changes of leadership. We have frequent changes of members of parliament. Um, members have possibilities and opportunities to, to become involved in designing the political platform and choosing the personnel. And this also applies for other parties in Mongolia. Um, you have to mention the Democratic Party, which is like a center-right party, um, the most, uh, the biggest opposition party, and also for some minor parties. So if we look at the institutionalization level of Mongolian democracy, we see a stable and functioning democracy, uh, which, of course, is not a given. There are threats to democracy in Europe. There are threats to democracy in Mongolia as well. Um, we all suffer from populism, so we know this very well in Germany or in Europe, uh, but we also know populism, nationalism uh, as well in Mongolia. Um, people, many people are unsatisfied with political parties uh, in general. This is a, a percentage of the population that has grown uh, over the last decade or so. There are many, many reasons for that. Uh, and not all of these reasons are properly addressed by the Mongolian parties. So I think this is a big challenge uh, that lies ahead for uh, the future of Mongolian democracy to take the grievances of the citizens into consideration when you want to change your party, when you want to change your government system, when you want to uh, change your constitution. And um, of course, there are external uh, threats to democracy. Um, the the COVID-19 pandemic, when you think about all the economic turmoil it brings, and Mongolia is a heavily export-orientated economy. And when the global economy is suffering, Mongolia is suffering even more. So I think this we saw uh, this year, it's a quite, it has been quite a challenging year for Mongolia. But also um, one thing that became more and more clear, clear for me recently and which is, which is in favor of the stability of democracy in Mongolia is how it dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when, when, the, when the pandemic broke out, when the first news of the pandemic broke, Mong the Mongolian government uh, reacted swiftly and decisively. So Mongolia started to, to implement the first protective measures as early as January. The Mongolian government, the Mongolian society took it extremely seriously and this paid off because Mongolia was a zero COVID country until a couple of weeks ago. So there were some cases, but all of them were imported. Uh, until five weeks ago, there were no local trans transmissions of COVID-19. And I think that's a really remarkable achievement. And when the first local transmissions appeared, um, again, the government, and this means MPP majority in the parliament and the MPP ministers in the government, acted swiftly and imposed a very strict lockdown that could be partially lifted after five weeks. And one last point I would like to make to, to point out how, how important democracy is for Mongolia, for Mongolians, is that we had a parliamentary election in June, a regular parliamentary election. It has been scheduled for quite some time. There was talk about postponing it um, because of the pandemic, but uh, the government, the people uh, stick to it. They held a parliamentary election with all the necessary measures. Uh, I think those of you who are joining us here who were campaigning know you had to wear the masks and not so many people were allowed at the, um, at the rallies. But in the end, Mongolia showed that you can have 
democratic elections, even in times of a, of a pandemic. And I think this was a very important point to make, not only for Mongolia, but for democracy globally, that the pandemic does not necessarily mean that you cannot have elections, that you cannot live your democracy. And I was very grateful to see that Mongolia made this point. And I was even more grateful to see that the Mongolian People's Party uh, won a resounding victory. Um, it was the first government since the democratic revolution that could continue its work after a elections. And lastly, because we're talking about a social democratic government, um, the government put a lot of effort into protecting the most vulnerable in the society. So the children's money was raised. Recently, uh, electricity bill, heating bill, water bill um, will be paid for at least partially by the government for the next six months and so on. There were many measures um, that took into consideration that many people are in need of assistance and should not be left behind, should not be forgotten even in times of crisis. And this is probably the way forward to the new normal that we have to live with the pandemic for quite some time, but we shouldn't uh, give away our democracy because we have to live with the pandemic. So the new normal means to cherish our democracy, even when the pandemic is around. And it also shows us that a strong government is needed that takes care of the most vulnerable in the society, doesn't let them fall behind for something they have no responsibility for. So I think those are the, the pathways to the new normal, stay democratic and take care of each other. And Mongolia is a, is a good example, maybe a hidden champion in this way forward. And that's why I'm really grateful to hold that Mongolia is hosting this conference, that you are all here. And I'm very excited for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Thank you for your input and for reminding us at the start of, of this conversation that social justice and democracy is not given and it will need political actors and progressive political parties like our sister party from Mongolia to be able to respond to the challenges of the times and also to be uh, on guard against the threats to, to democracy the head of the international relations of the Mongolian uh, People's Party. Um, Chelmon Manlaija, please take the floor and uh, we'll be delighted to hear from our panelists. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're now ready to begin the first panel discussion titled Our Roadmap to Just Normal. My name is Tumun Malajov, and I am the head of Department of International Relations of the Mongolian People's Party. And I'm also a board member of the youth wing of the Mongolian People's Party. And I have the honor to be the moderator of this panel discussion. So we're joined today by four distinguished guests from Europe and Asia. Elka Ferner is an executive member of the Party of European Socialist Women and a member of Social Democratic Party of Germany. Masaharo Nakagawa is a member of the House of Representatives of the Japan, Japanese National Diet and is a member of the Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan. Wondra Awanlov Sang is an advisor to the Mitchell Foundation. She is a former member of the parliament also former director of the Strategy Academy of Mongolia and is representing the Mongolian People's Party. Liu Qingtong is a central executive committee member of the Democratic Action Party of Malaysia and a former deputy minister of defense. Thanks to all the participants for joining us today. I have uh, prepared two questions to ask from each panelist after which we will take questions from the participants. So the first questions of round one are, how do we build a future that will not just put us back to the status quo, but forward a better future? And what are the respective parties putting forward that concerns their constituents and peoples of the region? Let's have a look forward, and uh, I would like um, to point out some uh, points uh, from a, a really feminist point of view, because um, I think um, 
that the crisis and its negative effects have many dimensions. The pandemic has changed not only our daily lives, it deepens inequalities between rich and poor, between North and South, and between men and women. And in a nutshell, it threatens our democracies. The pandemic has shown us the status of gender equality in a very impressive way. Women are working in the so-called system, systemic, systemically relevant sectors of our economies. For instance, in the social sector, especially the care and the health sector, in the education sector, but as well in the retail sector and other sectors which are important for our daily life. During the first lockdown, you know, uh, Germany is now uh, since two days in the second lockdown. Women worked, if possible, from home, teach their children, cared for their parents, made the house household, and if necessary, they reduced their working hours. It became obvious how badly paid these heroes of daily life are and under what kind of conditions they work every single day, even during the pandemic. And we spent applause, a lot of applause. During the first lockdown, we mentioned how important childcare facilities are, how hard teachers work is, how important the support of caregivers is. We mentioned that violence against women raised, raised a lot. And many, many women felt like to be catapulted back in times their mothers and grandmothers lived. lived. The real status of gender equality and the circumstances of women's daily life became visible like through a lens. Knowing all this, the recovery plans of the EU, but also of nearly all countries, didn't take the chance to implement measures to improve gender equality and to close the gender gaps. The public body spent as much money we never could imagine that it could be mobilized, but they didn't check the measures impact on gender equality. We really need to pay attention that existing gender gaps will not become deeper. And it's highly time to act. It's highly time to take the majority of our citizens into the center of our policies. It is highly time to, de to defend and to improve gender equality because gender equality is the precondition for a fair, for a sustainable and a social just society. And if we don't start to check every single measure and every single expense on their impact on gender equality, and if we don't stop measures and expenses which don't improve gender equality, we cannot establish a gender equal and a social just society. We will not reach the aim of equal pay for equal work and work of equal value. We will not reach the aim of an equal participation in the labor market and a financial independence of women. And we will not reach the aim of gender balanced decision making bodies in parliaments and governments. And why does a female president of uh, the EU Commission not focus on gender equality in the EU recovery plans? We don't have a lack of knowledge, but we have a lack of action to implement measures which improve gender equality. And therefore, we have to put the improvement of gender equality on the top of our political agenda. We need a gender equality analysis for every single measure and every single expense. We need to make gender equality to a cross-cutting issue. We need to eliminate all kinds of gender-based discriminations in the civil, social, and tax laws. We need action for equal pay and equal participation in the labor market, which will be a key driver for growing GDP. And we need more appreciation for the employees in the social sector, not only by applause, but also by improved working conditions and better payment. And we need gender balanced decision making bodies. We need to eliminate all forms of gender based violence and to protect and support the victims. And finally, we need the will to put the political will to put and to hold gender equality on the top of the political agenda. And who if not uh, the social democrats and the, the progressives have the obligation to do so. So I will close with this uh, short remarks and I hope we will have a good discussion because I think in nearly all countries, the gender dimension of the pandemic and the, the follows uh, of, the, of, the, of the pandemic will not be uh, appreciated as much uh, it should be. And therefore, I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, discuss with you. And I hope 
you will stay safe and healthy in the future till uh, the vaccine uh, is available all over the world. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy to be part of this very important event. And I would like to congratulate uh, Strategy Academy, Dr. Seichensana and her team for the 65th anniversary. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, conference. So I would like to uh, share uh, some of my perspectives with you, what uh, has been uh, the specific policy items uh, in Mongolia, also what are the uh, changes that I see are necessary to adapt to a new normal once uh, we get to uh, maybe a slightly normal functioning uh, environment. Uh, I think I agree with the Deputy Prime Minister that uh, some of the measures that our government has taken early on have paid off um, and we have a relatively small spread of uh, COVID in our country but still the economic impact is very severe and uh, I think it's too early to tell that you know we are over, uh, over the trouble. Um, let me begin uh, maybe with uh, some of the measurable um, um, me measurements of the policy. I, as a member of parliament, I was the chair of uh, parliamentary subcommittee on uh, sustainable development goals. And we all know that uh, SDGs were adopted in 2015 at UN General Assembly. And the goals uh, at the time are very ambitious, were very ambitious still very ambitious, you know, uh, just to name a few, the first uh, three would tell us immediately that no poverty, zero hunger, and uh, healthy uh, well-being society. So all these very imperative goals have been severely impacted by the rise of uh, this pandemic and the current uh, challenges that humanity is facing. Mongolia has been one of the first countries to adapt SDGs into national legislation. We, uh, the Parliament of Mongolia approved National Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030. And we have been building up data and measuring how well we were, we were doing in terms of achieving the goals. So um, at the time in, when I was MP, uh, the parliament and executive government, uh, the, the cabinet have worked together uh, some very specific uh, tool. So that was uh, SDG informed budgeting. In 2018, we have chosen the health sector to build a budget that's uh, consistent with our SDG goals. And it was very, very difficult to actually to, dra to draft the budget. Why is that? because our, our parliamentary system, 76 members, are elected by majoritarian system from 76 constituencies, and every lawmaker and member of parliament were more interested uh, or placing a higher priority on the health issues of his or her um, constituency. So when we look at the, the national budget collectively, it didn't necessarily coincide with our national health priority. So when the finance ministry and ministry of health have uh, drafted the budget, when they presented it to parliament, the budget uh, items were uh, uh, gone one by one and a lot of changes have been made. So it, uh, I think we, are only, we only had partial success. In 2019, the same effort has been done for um, environment and green development. So our SDG goals, when we try to measure it from the budgetary perspective, were slightly better in the uh, environmental policy and green development policy. And we have presented our national volunteer report at the UN in 2019 for the first time at the high level political meeting. And uh, so why am I uh, talking about budget? Uh, it's very important to see if you can successfully uh, see the development, reduction of poverty, uh, really increase the quality of life for people, if you can measure the data. And in uh, this year in 2020, after the parliamentary election, new government, new parliament have approved 
uh, our national vision for 2050. Uh, and uh, very recently, as you know, Japan and Korea uh, have uh, approved their green development plan. And uh, um, I think it set a specific goal that they will be carbon free by 2050. Uh, same goal has been set forward by China. By 2060, they will, the economy will be green economy. So I think these kind of ambitious goals that uh, Mongolia has set forward, our neighboring countries set forward, are kind of pulled back after the pandemic. We had, the, let me just finish with one number. We, uh, our poverty rate was uh, about just under 30% uh, in 2019 data. So what does it mean? It's like approximately one in every three people have, uh, are under the poverty line. So we really have to focus very, very hard on the long-term goal our uh, original goal was to bring the poverty to one digit number, which meant that it, we had to reduce the, reduce the poverty rate to at least 2% every year. So because of the pandemic, I think the economy is uh, really hit hard and I think uh, we will have a higher poverty rate. So uh, the hope to reduce poverty, eliminate it altogether is gonna be very, very challenging. I think uh, just one example is the educational system. Most school-aged children are staying home and online learning, distance learning, televised uh, classrooms, etc., are impacting and affected by how well the students are equipped in terms of infra infrastructure. Even this our conference, we see that the internet availability is impacting the quality of audio and video. Um, so, it, uh, it sometimes it's random, but sometimes it's just uh, really the families do not have access to some of the necessary infrastructure for their children to get proper quality education. So I think the quality of education is going to be even more suffering uh, because of the um, inequality. So I, I, I think down the, down the road, we see higher uh, poverty rate we're gonna see more inequality. And that doesn't mean we have to reduce our goal. We still have to be very ambitious in terms of uh, um, in policy of uh, increasing the quality of life for people. Uh, so I would like to encourage everybody to not to become ambitious, but even uh, with a positive note, uh, maybe all these uh, um, online classes, online meetings, e-commerce, uh, electronic measurements uh, are going to be useful for a uh, new type of economy, digital economy, greener economy, more participatory economy, etc. So I would like to hear uh, if anybody has questions. Thank you. I, it's a, it gives me great pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, and also, I would like to congratulate the uh, Mongolia People's Party for your anniversary. Uh, it's a great achievement that uh, you you managed to contain COVID and also to uh, to win elections. It's an important year, and this is a, this has been a difficult year for Malaysia and for the region. We are facing a triple crisis. We are facing a health crisis uh, in terms of COVID. We are facing a political crisis in Malaysia. But also, we are facing long-term economic uh, crisis that uh, we have ignored, uh, structural issues that we have ignored, and we are now uh, have we now have to deal with it. I think uh, broadly, globally, we are also uh, dealing with a much larger problem. We are now at the end of this world order that was established after World War II. Uh, the, the multilateral system that has served the world very well uh, in many ways since 1945 is somehow being challenged and there needs to be adjust, adjust, uh, adjustment. Also, this is like 30 years after uh, the end of Cold War, uh, 30 years, uh, th more than 30 years after uh, Berlin Wall fell. And there needs to be a new way of dealing with a situation where the United States is no longer dominant, uh, but it's still the largest country for the years and years to come. 
but there are challenges uh, in the form of China, in the form of Russia, Iran, um, and there are many uh, middle powers, and there are also small countries with agencies, and it is time for us to find a new way of organizing the world. In terms of economy, the East Asia economy, of which Malaysia is part of, has been very dependent on exporting to the United States. I know Mongolia perhaps is not part of that whole uh, eco chamber, that whole system, uh, that whole ecosystem, but Malaysia, uh, to a less extent, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, we have been exporting to the United States and Europe for the last 50 to 60 years. Uh, the, the economy, the backbone of the economy was to export to the US and also to receive outsourcing investment, investment of uh, manufacturing outsourcing from the United States and uh, perhaps also Germany uh, to this part of the world. Now this outsourcing is being challenged by COVID-19, but of course it's also being challenged by the political crisis uh, in the United States, uh, the, the unemployment situation in Europe. I mean, all this has contributed to, to this situation where in the years to come, we will probably see shorter uh, supply chain. We will see less outsourcing. And where will be, where will be inv the investment coming from? Where will be the jobs being created? I think those are the challenges uh, that we may face in our region. And I think in terms of world economy, uh, the, the neoliberal ideas that has dominated Anglo-Saxon world in the last 40 years, uh, since Margaret Thatcher, since Ronald Reagan, is now being challenged and is now perhaps uh, coming to an end. But what is to replace this neoliberal idea? What is to replace this over-financialization of the global economy system? Uh, is something that I think we all have to deal with. I would, I would not want to drag for too long, but I think uh, they, we will need to think about, as social democrat, we will need to think about how to build back better. We need to think about how to build back better. We will need to tap into our connections, our collaborations uh, in terms of Europeans. Uh, we have Europeans here. We have uh, friends who are more connected to to. Uh, Central Asia, where friends who are connected to the East Asia, the East Asian economy, we will have to find ways to build back better in terms of the economy. I think we, we together we have to build a better healthcare system, not just in our domestic society, but we may have to do more uh, among our nations, between our nations, uh, so that we can improve our healthcare system. And, and we are trying to avoid uh, healthcare nationalism or COVID vaccine nationalism that we are likely to see uh, in the months to come. Uh, the COVID, COVID uh, vaccine nationalism is unfortunate. It is happening, it is un unfortunate, but I think uh, hopefully after half a year, after the, the developed uh, world, is uh, well half vaccinated and with more COVID vaccines coming out, we can avoid COVID nationalism and we can cover the globe, uh, particularly the least developed country and also the, the developing countries more. And we can at least find some form of uh, COVID vaccine equal, equal access or, or some form of equal access, equ uh, equitable distributions of vaccine, which will be very important for the world as none of us live in isolation we need to ensure that others are vaccinated so that we can open our borders and we can avoid uh, another wave of uh, infections we will also have to deal with the questions of climate change uh, hopefully and hopefully by dealing dealing with climate change we can create new type of jobs new type of employment uh, climate or green related employment um, well, Europe talks about Green New Deal. Uh, we haven't actually seeded those ideas in the, in the practical terms in our part of the region. But I think because of the need of creating employment to, to cover or to compensate the losses of employment in tourism sector, in uh, airline uh, sectors, in some other sectors, 
we will have to consider how to use the, the role, how, how the state can play a role in financing and in creating conditions for uh, new type of jobs, particularly, particularly in green and climate related uh, uh, sector, so that with those jobs, we can build a society better and at the same time contribute to uh, better climate conditions in the years to come. And of course, uh, the digital divide within our society and also across the globe is something that we will have to find investment and we also have to find ways of uh, dealing with dealing with the, the digital divide within our nation and also across the globe. My final point is that uh, for, for the world to be secured, uh, we need to find a way to accommodate a situation, as I mentioned earlier, a security situation in which the United States will still be very, a very strong nation, but middle powers will have to work together. Uh, small nations will have to work together and to, to find a situation where we will not enter into a global uh, competitions of great powers, but actually states can find a way to accommodate each other to find useful purposes uh, from the point of uh, social democrats uh, so that we can actually create both uh, a just and also uh, just equitable and peace, peaceful world. A uh, peaceful world is not guaranteed. Uh, we will have to work, uh, work more in order to ensure a peaceful world. Uh, with that, I thank you very much. Well, I, just I uh, said before, uh, the present situation that we have to overcome, uh, our policy would be the consent. Consent is more valued more than coercion, so that uh, uh, the request base of the governors will reach to the people and try to restrict their movement and the business. So this is the present uh, uh, situation that we are facing. And in the field of long-term uh, policies, uh, there are several targets that we should seek and realize. First, our economic and social policy will move away from the neoliberalism of the present uh, ruling party, the LDP, influenced by the American way of economic uh, uh, management. Uh, they place a priority on competition and the forced responsibility on individuals, saying that the uh, smaller the government, the better, and the lower the regulations, the better. Uh, our new opposition party, uh, centered around the CDP, the Constitutional Dem Democratic Party, uh, instead proposes uh, the shift to a society of mutual support. In such a society, people can cooperate together and support each other, and government can be proactive to overcome uh, virus risks and barriers. On this principle of social democracy, uh, we are now setting forward clear, concrete targets. In order to rebuild our economy after COVID-19, the growing economic divide has to be amended by tax reform, redistributing the wealth of corporations as well as individuals. And also, we have to recover a wide range of middle-class group in our society. Child care and education accompanied by scientific innovation are the important fields for future generations. We need to invest more in them. We also focus on the non-carbon energy shift among climate environment projects. These are the main uh, theme that we are going to seek inside Japan, inside uh, our country. And for in international uh, scene, I would uh, mention on the, the second uh, uh, occasion. Thank you very much to all the participants for your stimulating discussions. We touched upon the role of political economies in sharing the new normal, reducing poverty through sustainable policy and state budgeting, expressed our worries 
for the outgoing disorder in governance and decision making, which has affected millions of people. We have also called for equal pay and participation in labor mar markets, as well as political will to put gender equality on the top of the political agenda. <clears throat> Without further ado, the second question of the panelists, how do we work better as progressives? As an international community, what should we prioritize? So I think as uh, on our um, own agenda, we also have to put gender equality on uh, on the top and uh, to, uh, we should make it a cross-cutting issue uh, in all our uh, policies. What I see is that uh, if uh, someone writes a paper to uh, about economy, uh, it's uh, gender, dis um, gender inequalities are not mentioned uh, in it. And uh, as we know from many researchers, uh, the impact of uh, gender equality in the labor market and in economy is really a key driver for a growing GDP, the, the best key driver for a growing GDP. Um, and also uh, the, 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 the SDGs were mentioned before, um, in, with the SDGs, we committed all, uh, all our countries committed and all the, the uh, world community committed um, to improve gender equality and to reach gender equality to 2030. And it's also a question of social justice because uh, the differences between uh, men and women, the inequalities between men and women are uh, so so called so called mirror to to the society inequalities from rich to poor and from north to south and uh, you you can see all has a gender dimension and so from from my opinion uh, gender equality is uh, is key and the pre really the precondition for a better progressive uh, sustainable uh, development and a uh, social uh, just society Okay, in the uh, international field, I have to point out here that global cooperation among progressive uh, pro uh, political groups in each country will come to be the key engine uh, for the future world. We need to form an international coalition for the future. Uh, we should strongly support the WHO's fundraising for the distribution of coronavirus uh, and uh, uh, vaccines, especially targeting developing countries. The United Nations SDGs have to be shared by all nations as uh, post-corona goals. Moreover, international taxation to cope with the global environment should be considered and agreed upon by major countries. I also propose to create a World Organization to make new systems for redistribution of wealth actually workable. From this standpoint, uh, the long trend of corporate tax cuts by major countries has to be stopped and some sort of agreement to raise tax together and also to put measures to implement broader taxation to international final transactions as well as the digital communication field. Uh, these are the targets that we uh, try to get uh, some uh, financial uh, source uh, from uh, major uh, companies and uh, try to recycle it inside of each countries and to uh, make a foundation of a basic service or basic income to the people. Uh, this is the way that we are thinking to reform whole uh, system of uh, political uh, stream in the world. And I think uh, we're here to promote the worldwide wave of democracy and the socialistic uh, idea of progressive. I'm glad that the Japanese uh, parliamentarians have been invited. We, we want to join with you and together seek progress uh, idealism I'm really looking forward to seeing you in a real meeting after the COVID-19 pandem pandemic has been overcome. 
thank you uh, for all your input. Um, as progressives, I think uh, I would like to suggest uh, two approaches going forward. Um, one is, uh, the first is, we have to uh, all try to fight protectionism. Uh, why am I saying that? I think in the rise of uh, COVID and uh, as countries have national policies to uh, reduce poverty or maybe to secure food supply, uh, many of the countries are adopting protectionist measures. So <clears throat> in, uh, in our country, for example, what we consider strategic food are meat and flour. And some countries, of course, uh, different countries have different strategic uh, food category, for example, rice, or um, it could be anything for the specific culture. But the, <clears throat> I think because of protectionism, uh, global trade uh, might be suppressed. And same, we can talk about vaccine distribution. So maybe it's understandable because uh, all everybody is worried about whether uh, food would be secure and supply would be sufficient. Uh, many countries are being worried about if there is enough vaccine to be distributed to everybody and the prioritization is needed. But my worry is if we let uh, collectively as progressives, if we let this protectionism uh, remain this way, we may uh, see more iso 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 isolated uh, policies. So instead of the countries to uh, have policy only worrying about their own nations, oh, yeah. I think we need to also try to find ways to cooperate and go exactly against these protectionist measures and be more open. And uh, my uh, view is such uh, open co collaborative policies will ensure better recovery of the economy and better transfer of knowledge, better in interaction and exchange of ideas. And uh, so that's uh, an agenda item I would like to propose to my colleagues from uh, different countries. The second is I echo our colleague from Germany uh, that the, the gender equality should be on the central part of the agenda, as Elke pointed out. <clears throat> when gender equality is not ensured, I think equitable participation for uh, men and women or other minority self-identified groups, it, unless everybody is uh, given equal opportunity, it is very difficult to ensure just and better society. You see, we would, if there is not uh, enough uh, uh, equality, I think it breeds uh, uh, um, dissatisfaction and um, maybe oh, wow. even tension. And I, I, I think we, we see a rise of uh, terrorist events, separated but coordinated events, unrest, uh, security challenges. Uh, many countries are rising, raising their defense budget. And I think uh, uh, globally these days, the arms race, um, maybe military budgets and uh, defense technology is not being discussed very much openly. All the world focuses on the pandemic and healthcare crisis and how we can get over uh, the health issues and economy and fighting so that everybody would have food to eat, children have school to go. So I think these basic, very important issues are at the center. And while we are focusing on that, some of the global achievements, such as uh, uh, denuclearization, reduction of uh, um, nuclear weapons, uh, re reducing risk of biological or ter uh, chemical uh, attacks or ter combating terrorism, these issues are perhaps not being paid attention to as they should be. So uh, I think the second item that I want to suggest is this equality issue. Uh, and uh, I, I have been privileged to be part of this uh, global committee on uh, gender diversity in the corporate boardroom. So I know, for example, Japan has been pushing 
for better participation of uh, women in workplace, promotion of women in corporate uh, pro uh, corporate uh, system. Uh, in uh, some other countries, uh, like uh, Germany, I believe, have had the legislation to increase number of women who are in the corporate uh, board and management positions and have a better policy for women to return to work even if and when she uh, has fulfilled her duty as with the young children. Uh, so I think policies like that need to be open and adapted. Best practices can be shared and encouraged to be adapted faster than before so that we can recover, build better future as uh, progressives. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think fundamentally, uh, progressive and social, social democrats, we are very much internationalists. How do we uh, resist the temptation of uh, protectionism, as pointed out earlier? Or how do we ensure that there is no race to the bottom, uh, that we can reverse the, the, the neoliberal idea of race, racing to the bottom? I think that will be our challenge. Uh, how to resist our domestic population from thinking in race to the bottom uh, manner will, will challenge us in the years and years to come. Two, key, two points uh, that we can think about. One, uh, Mr. Nakagawa, Nakagawa mentioned about uh, tax. How do we avoid competitive tax cut among countries? How do we work together to ensure that there's no tax evasion? Uh, and in fact, many countries will have to start thinking of avoiding competitive tax cut. In Asia, Singapore and Hong Kong runs a very low tax rate uh, because they have no hinterland, whereas other countries have hinterland. But they, these societies are now facing a situation where they have serious inequality within their society. Uh, they, they have a, an aging population that required a lot more investment in healthcare. And at some point, they will also have to tax more in order to strengthen their healthcare or deal with housing questions in Hong Kong. Now, this is basically an example where competitive tax cut uh, is a race to the bottom that we have to resist and reverse. The other question is uh, migrant workers. How do we ensure that migrant workers are given the, the rights in our society, in every other society, in order to both protect the migrant workers, but also to, rely, to, to reduce reliance on cheap labor? I think that is a difficult, difficult balance. But I give you an example, in Malaysia, uh, and actually, I see in Singapore as well, because of the poor housing condition for migrant workers, COVID cases happen mostly among uh, cheap labor, cheap foreign labor colonies, um, among the dormit because of dormitories, you have 20 people, 40 people squeezing in a small place, and COVID spread either in prison or among foreign workers. And these are cheap labor. Some of them are not uh, documented. Now, how do we protect them, their rights? How do we ensure that they have equitable housing, they have decent housing? It's very important, both from a human, human rights point of view, but also important from an economic point of view. We want to ensure that they would not, that there is no race to the bottom in terms of, uh, uh, because you don't have to pay them more, you can give them lousy housing, and therefore you deprive domestic worker, uh, you put domestic workers uh, at a dis disadvantage because of their, uh, what they call, you, you need to pay Malaysians uh, or domestic workers higher. So that balance, how do we treat foreign workers, uh, how do we treat migrant workers equitably, and at the same time, so that uh, you don't you don't place domestic worker as a, at a disadvantage, and how to encourage society to to look at paying workers more and paying workers more equitably as uh, as a as a good thing as a good thing so that 
we increase domestic consumption. We allow for domestic consumption because uh, workers are paid better. And that both fulfill our mission as a social democrat, but also it makes sense from an economic point of view uh, so that we are not entirely dependent on export economy. Now, these are challenges that are uh, balance that we will have to make in our society. As much as, I, as we can, I hope we can uh, be committed to our values, but translate them into compromises in our society that tilt towards the balance of the workers and also tilt towards the balance uh, to, to ordinary Malaysians and ordinary people in our society. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to all panelists for the wonderful discussion and to all participants for the active engagement. We hope you were inspired by the speakers and panelists today. Thank you. Thank you.